welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. Greetings and welcome, Mark. It's fantastic to have you on the podcast show. Hi, Bilal. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Great. I mean, I've, uh, I, I really enjoyed your book, How the World Became Rich, and I'd urge all of our listeners to, uh, to, to get the book. And we'll be focusing on that on, on this uh, on on this uh, podcast, and I have to say, the name is a fantastic sort of name of a book. You know, it's it's says what it does on the tin. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the book came out in 2022 with Oliver T Press, and um, so we've covered with Joe Rubin, I should say. And um, yeah, we're 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 really um, excited that people are still discovering a book and they're still picking it up and reading it. It's, it's been really good. Right now, before we go into it, I did want to ask something about your origin story. Um, where did you go for university? What did you study? Was it inevitable you would end up in economics and academia? Yeah, so I um I went to university in Oxford, both undergraduate and graduate school. So now, you know, it doesn't feel like a long time ago, but now a uh, fairly long time ago, I, I I went there in two thousand. So Trinity College, and I was at Wadham College, and so um, I did history and economics. Which then leads you come naturally to economic history, but like I don't think I was planning on being I was I wasn't planning planning on being an academic at that point. It was just a uh, you know great undergraduate experience and great um great opportunity to study with like a lot of uh, fantastic professors. And um, graduate school is just something I gradually got into via the masters, basically. So you know, I don't know how much audience is academic or more policy focused, um, but from an academic perspective, these days a lot of a lot of to, to get into a topic on PhD program, you help you have to a lot of like training. Basically, you have to work as an RA for somebody often, and there's this whole phenomena called pre docs, where people before they start graduate study, they spend several years working as a permanent research assistant for some professor, and so basically you kind of have to decide if you want to go back to academia when you're maybe I don't know some very young age, so that you've taken enough mathematics classes and you're prepared enough that you can get into like a top school. Um, and then you're, you, by the time you graduate with your PhD, you're probably 30 or older than 30, uh, which I don't think is a great equilibrium to be in. But but in my case, I didn't do any of that stuff. And I, I kind of realized I wanted to be an academic at some point when I was doing my PhD. Okay, fantastic. And and where are you now? What do you... Uh, uh, I'm at George Mason. Focus? Yeah, it's so a George Mason University, um, which is just in the, um, in the Beltway, just outside the Beltway, in DC, so it's North Virginia, uh, but we're about fifteen miles from 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 DC, and um, it's a very nice nice location, nice university, um, public university, very big, with forty thousand students. So I've been there since twenty eleven, so a long time, and uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 famous for I, I think it's I mean famous for its economics department, partly because of the prominence of people like Tyler Cowen as bloggers, and. Um, and it's a famous, somewhat famous for its law school as well. But it's uh, it's a good place to be. And um, I do economic history. Um, I'm in the economics department, so I teach like regular economics classes. But I, I, I I've been teaching economic history since I got here. And and Jared, my co-author, has been teaching economic history to undergraduates as well since he arrived in, in Chapman around about the same time I've been at George Mason. So we both have basically about ten years. When we wrote a book about ten years' experience, now more than ten years' experience. Teaching undergraduates basically about this topic, like how the world became rich. That's that's how my course was designed, and so then it was a natural thing to do to kind of come together and write the book. And uh, it was a very smooth writing process because we we kind of been thinking about both this, you know, we're thinking about this topic for our research as well as our teaching. But when when, it, when we're teaching a subject, you're also focused about basically not just projecting your own perspective, but giving a um, a broad overview of like this is what the profession currently thinks about these topics and then also presenting that fairly presenting other people's views fairly and then and then uh presenting it in digestible bite-sized pieces that people can can kind of you know that can understand without you know swamping them with the minutia of cotton textiles in 18th century england Okay, that's fantastic. That's great. And of course, you know, the, the research you said is is about how the world became rich, um, which is often there's a lot of debate around this, you know, what made certain parts of the world become rich over the last couple of hundred years. And more recently, some of the Asian countries, people discuss it at dinner table, people argue about it a lot. Um, 
So first of all, in terms of some of the definitions you know, that you focus on in your work, um, when you talk about growth um, and how you're measuring growth and, and, and so on over hundreds of years of period, how do you define all of this? Because there's different ways of measuring success of societies in the world, and you focused on obviously economic growth. So perhaps we can start with definitions. Yeah. So, I mean, in some terms, I think everybody, we're all interested in, in well, most of us, I hope, are interested in, in some broad measure of prosperity. So that's what we, we care about. Um, so that that's both uh, material and non-material. So, you know, it's material and it's having enough food to eat, it's having access to medicines, it's having, you know, a comfortable place to live, it's having enough energy to your house. Um, but, but also, of course, like, you know, we don't just eat GDP, we care about other things. We care about, like, you know, leisure time and and having, you know, a good family life or cultural life or all these other things. And so, um, you know, different people care about different things. And so um, we're aware of, like, you know, GDP is not everything, but actually our claim, and I think it's pretty well supported, is that GDP is the best proxy we have for this general prosperity we care about. So if a country or society is producing more stuff, you know, so has there more options for people who say you want to consume more, more, more leisure. Or, or 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 do focus on other things. It's sort of greater diversity of, kind of consumption opportunities. So so we're not claiming that like people should work so hard that we maximize GDP. I think it's a straw man that people have of economists, which is incorrect. We're saying, you know, precisely because we care about other stuff, we want to have enough GDP so that we have you know time left over or resources left over once we've cut one, you know, to, to to focus on those things. So GDP is is a good proxy for that. Um, you know, you it correlates well with other measures we care about. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but it, but it's good. And then um, there's the issue of measurement, and that issue of measurement becomes more of an issue when you go back in time, because obviously societies in the past weren't collecting you know GDP numbers in the same way we're collecting them. And we know today that GDP numbers are subject to revision; they're not always that accurate. There's some problems with them. And it's obviously very get magnified when um, you know, the bigger problems further back you go. Um, and so we, we do touch upon some of our economic history debate about like how good are these numbers to be correlate with other things. And and as you further as you go further back, you kind of have to rely on other other proxies often. So you know like um their biological measures of height. So like uh, sorry uh, of well being height is one of them. Um so that's on my head. So um you know height uh, it's a reflection of childhood and uh, uh, nutrition, basically. So if people are very stunted, that's a sign people are very poor. Um, obviously, once you reach a certain threshold of income, height isn't going to be measuring nutrition that much, and height might be really picking up some other factors like genetics, but but it's a good proxy for pre-industrial societies about nutritional stress. Uh, life expectancy also picks up something we, we're definitely interested in. Um, we have data for real wages for many societies going back a long way. Real wages are, 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 you know, are picking up, they're good at picking up basically the average of an ordinary person who's a wage earner in at least in many societies. Like how, how well are they doing? How many goods can they buy relative to a price level? Okay, no, that's great. Yeah, oh, obviously we, we, we're sort of dealing with proxies, uh, I, you know, I imagine when we go back far, far, far enough. But if we kind of go to the theories, then there are lots of different theories about what makes nations rich, what makes the world rich. Um, if we run through some of them, you know, there's some arguments to say geography is what matters. So if you're in the right type of terrain, right, right type of environment that gives you access to energy and resources and transport options, then then you've, you're lucky in terms of being in the right part of the world. And that, that explains why some countries end up being richer than others. Um, you know what? 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 What does your 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 work find on that? Yeah. So we we take these um, factors kind of sequentially. So beginning of geography, as you say, and maybe we'll get to some of the others like institutions and and culture and and, and dem democracy. So um, our, our our approach is to basically survey different approaches some people have had in the first part of the book, and then and and put them into these thematic categories. So geography uh, being one, and um, you know. Um, Geography is an important factor. So, you know, like we live in this physical world where where our economic opportunities are very much mediated by geography. So, you know, like um, Silicon Valley still matters, right? Proximity to other tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley is, is hugely important for productivity. Being in a geographical hub like you know, London or New York uh, matters. And similarly, um, 
transport still matters. So we still physically, a lot of goods are uh, still transported physically. And so that matters. Sea lanes matter, as we know. And so if you're a landlocked, um, if you have a disadvantageous economic geography, you're very mountainous or rugged, think about someone like Nepal, um, uh, Bolivia. It means like, you know, like there's no getting around it. This is a disadvantage. Um, so, so we talk about these different ways of geography can matter, how it, how it's mediated by things like the disease environment. So geography determines the disease environment, that then feeds into kind of like, you know, um, poverty today, but also poverty in the past. And poverty in the past would limit your opportunities to grow. Uh, but where we come down is to say that, you know, on its own, geography can't really explain the, 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 the full phenomenon we're interested in, partly because it's, it, it explains kind of cross-sectional differences, like at a given point in time, some place is richer than some other place, but the timing, it's harder to explain with geographical stories. And then it also can't explain any reversals. Um, so there are quite a few kind of reversals, you know, uh, uh, but the star, one of the starkest ones is the Middle East versus Western Europe. So a thousand years ago, the Middle East is, is undoubtedly richer than Western Europe. Baghdad is... is one of the largest cities in the world, something larger than any European city. So, you know, Baghdad to London, Baghdad is much richer in fa- a thousand um, AD than, than London is. And obviously, by 1800, that's not true. But it's not true today either. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in that, I mean, in that case, I mean, could you say that, you know, obviously that you had the sort of the Mongol invasion of the Middle East? Uh, I'm not sure at what point, whether it coincides with the decline of the Middle East. I mean, do, does something like that? You know, affect things, or or was that not enough? That could explain like yeah. a temporary setback, but wouldn't explain like a long exactly. setback. That's a great question. So yeah, exactly. Um, so and well, I, I'll touch up. I'll use that to touch on culture as well because it's related, and we do do mention it briefly. Um, so in in a in a in a theory of what economists would call economic fundamentals. So there's there's some some economic theories which say you know, or locational fundamentals. Sorry, locational fundamentals. So the locational act is a key. Um, a story of locational fundamentals, basically a negative shock like the Mongol invasions or something else should lead to a temporary decline. But then once that shock has passed, there should be very high returns to investing in that place again. And so the, the, the classic example of this was actually a paper by Donald Davidson and, uh, and, and a co-author about 20 years ago, where we looked at cities in Japan after, after the bombing of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki after bombing. Uh, bombings uh, in World War Two, basically, and so they're like, um, you know, like you might think that if you basically wipe out these two cities, um, well, according to some theories, there's no reason why they would come back where they were because what matters is agglomeration effect. So basically, the people would reallocate to other cities. But if those locations are just very good locations for economic activity, but if there's some geographical feature about the world which means you want to have a city in Hiroshima, then it's going to bounce back. And and what we find is obviously Hiroshima bounces back very very quickly. Um, but Baghdad doesn't bounce back from its decline. Its decline begins firstly. Its decline begins well before the Mongol invasions, as far as we can tell. So its high point is really ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth centuries. So it's still a big city by the time the Mongol sack it, which is 1258. Um, but it's not like at its peak of prosperity. And and something about the, the Mongol invasions um, uh, do lead to a permanent decline there. And so there has to be some other factor explaining why people don't just return to it af- afterwards. And so so potentially the institutional environment has changed, the train networks have been disrupted. Um, there are other stories, though, about the relative decline of not particularly Baghdad, but the Middle East. And one of them is a, is a cultural story. So there's this closing of the gates of Islam um, around 1100, where Islam becomes more conservative and less, less there's less kind of religious competition. There's less um, the era where Muslim scholars are translating texts from Aristotle and Plato and integrating that with Islam. That was happening before 1100, and it, and it goes away after 1100. Um, so there are other stories about that relative decline. And I think that, um, yeah, just a, a one-off shot, like an invasion, can't quite explain it. Okay, no, that's great. We'll come back to the culture point in a moment. But the other thing people often talk about are institutions, you know, that if you have the right institutions, then that explains growth. But I guess first, how do we define institutions? And and is it, um, 
is it endogenous to to becoming rich? I mean, is it because you're rich you build institutions, or I mean, what comes yeah. first? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, so, so this is a, you know, it's a great question. And actually, someone um, I read a comment criticizing our book actually, uh, and uh, someone read the chapter on institutions. So they were like, "This is a very simple story, naive story about institutions, and actually, it's much richer, more complex." And uh, and and, and uh, you know the, the the person gave up reading the book I think after that chapter and they didn't read on. Um, so uh, where well, we we do add, add nuances. So like in our geography chapter, we want to set out you know, this is how economists think about institutions first before adding in like the layers layers of nuance. And so um, the way economists think about institutions is really um, based on the work of Douglas North, who won a Nobel Prize jointly in about 1992. For, for his study of economic history. And so the idea there is there's some kind of, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's an abstract concept, which is institutions structure the incentives we face. So whatever, you know, they're rules of the game in his terminology. And so whatever um, uh, rules of the game we have in society, those are our institutions. But when it comes to implementing this concept, in terms of like, you know, what do we really mean by this? Often, like scholars in this Northian tradition focus on the property rights of the system, or the market economy, or or something like that, or the patent system. And so, um, you know, a standard kind of Northian story will be secure property rights, needs give you the incentive to invest or to innovate or to you know build up your own business, and that's key for growth. And insecure property rights, like you don't own your land or you can't buy and sell your land, you can't borrow against it, you can't use it as collateral, or some predatory ruler can seize your land, insecure property rights are going to basically be impediments to growth and development. And um, that's kind of the big picture story that a lot of economists have in mind. And, and so that work by North was really picked up by Darren S. Mogu and Jim Robinson in the kind of 2000s. And they have a very famous book, which many of your listeners may have read or heard about, which is called How uh, Why Nations Fail, which is very much an institution story about, about how um, countries become rich. And they're kind of um, um, real, real kind of, I guess, addition is to think about the relationship between the economic institutions, things like property rights, and the political institutions, things like democracy, rule of law, um, you know, political institutions which constrain the state. And, that, and that's kind of the big picture view. Um, Economists have, but your question was to get was getting at this more subtle point, which is you know you, you can't necessarily take the institutions as, as a given or as a prejudice. Maybe they're improving as society is improving, um, and so that's definitely uh, possible. And, and and yeah, a lot of the more sophisticated work is thinking about institutional change and its interaction with other factors, so its interaction with geography, with culture, and so on. Okay, understood. And I mean, just in terms of institutions, um, I mean, presumably it, it just wasn't the Western, Northern Western Europeans who understood something about property rights and things like that. I mean, I, I imagine, you know, the, the, the Greeks knew about it during the classical era, you know, the Chinese, I imagine, knew about 2000 years ago. So what, I mean, what, why, why yeah, should they so, become rich like the, you know, yeah. today or something? So, so that's, so that's, so, so that, well, the two, I think, things to separate out, which is so property rights are definitely yeah so this is like a, a myth that you know like it's a i mean we actually avoid using the word um capitalism in our book a bit okay and we 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 um we're economists and we say like you know relative to non-economists we, we, we're gonna come off as like uh people will think about us as they'll call us things like neoliberal or pro market but we're not actually naive cheerleaders for like gay capitalism all you need is property rights to grow. So we're definitely not a, not in that camp. We're telling a much rich kind of historical story, and it's it's, it's 100 true that there are property rights in China, there are property rights in ancient Greece, ancient Rome is a very robust set of property rights. So it's not like oh yeah, you discover property rights and you get rich mm -hmm. um, uh, by no means. What I would say though is the, the there's a um, there's a difference between like a recognition that these property rights matter and then a robust kind of political system. Which which is self reinforcing and not not to kind of infringe upon these too much and and, and in many of these pre modern societies people didn't have a lot of problems with property rights over say land uh, it's quite an intuitive concept but more intangible property rights are harder harder for people to kind of envision and then the the the, the property rights of kind of business 
people, particularly as those business people get rich and potentially threaten the power of those who have kind of landed power. That's a little bit more uncertain, I think, in all of these other societies. Um, but yeah, but, but the market, so we think of these property rights as quite ubiquitous, but, but, but also um, a prerequisite. So you, you, we don't, um, attempts to shortcut the system of growth, this, you know, there, there, there are societies which don't have these, there are societies which are kind of, have some kind of more, more communal system, like more, um, you know, like, like small scale societies often have communal property systems and so on, but those don't develop. So you have to pass through the stage of kind of large scale agrarian society, uh, market economies, property rights, uh, more complex economic forms of organization before uh, you're going to industrialize. But it's not um, not a sufficient condition, and it's going to interact with other things. And the, when you look at the story of England, it's a more complex, nuanced, layered story in terms of how the property rights are evolving alongside the development of political institutions more generally. Okay, and and okay, so understood. And so then if we go into culture, um, now culture today means all sorts of different things in this kind of polarized world that, that we live in. But in your term, in, in, in the way you describe it, in, in terms of how it links to economic growth and, and wealth and so on, what, what, what do you mean by culture? Yeah, so we're taking kind of um, an in, a view influenced by um, recent work by a kind of anthrop cultural anthropologist, which is um, to, to label as culture kind of heuristics that people rely on uh, to make decisions. So, but which are which are inherited or partly inherited, but and transmitted parent to child, potentially also horizontally transmitted, but are not like immutable. They can change, and so um, some of these cultural traits are better understood than others. Um, so, I mean, in some sense, one of the ones we're most, we're most interested in is kind of attitudes to change and innovation, but that's only been recently studied, where I say trust is, is quite a commonly studied, um, studied one. So we know today that more trusting societies are richer. So there's a correlation between trust and, and riches, but you know, as, as you'll no doubt kind of, uh, guess, your readers will guess, that, that correlation is not necessarily a causal one because it goes both ways. You know, if I'm living in a very dangerous, poverty-stricken society, I'm not going to trust people because they're going to, they're going to be likely to rob rob me. But if I live in like you know like Norway, very rich, stable society, I'm going to trust people more. So trust is obviously endogenous, but it's also good for development because you know it reduces a lot of transaction costs. If you don't trust somebody, you're not going to accept the check from them, right? You're going to only only do cash transactions on hand. You're not going to you know credit. Um, Credit cards aren't going to work as well. Um, business dealings are going to be more difficult to deal with. You only go want to go into business with family members, not with strangers. So, but where does trust come from? It's partly inherited. It's, it seems to be partly inherited. And so things like past um, shocks or past wars or conflicts can affect the trust of people living today. So this work by Nathan Nunn showing that the Legacy of a slave trade in Sub-Saharan Africa seems to impede trust in in in, in Sub-Saharan African countries today, okay. and so trust can cultural traits like trust can impact with institutions because how well the institutions perform depend on these cultural traits. Okay, so so far, I mean, what we're coming to is that geography um, can help, but it's not decisive. We're saying institutions matter, but institutions matter in the sense that you have some sort of bundle of kind of political and economic institutions have to kind of interact in the right way together. And then uh, sort of cultural traits, which can sort of be passed down through society, particularly in relation to trust, and perhaps we'll find out in, in relation to change helps as well. Um, now, another one that people often talk about is demography and, you know, death and things like that. You know, the Black Death, people talk about how that initially you know, was obviously quite terrible, but then it introduced uh, sort of big productivity gains. Um, so there seems to be all sorts of interesting dynamics with population and demography. Uh, so help me unpack that. Yeah, so I think the, 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 the starting point is the, um, the Malthusian um, framework, which is uh, Thomas Malthus, doom and gloom. But the basic idea is the population growth absorbs gains in, in per capita income over time because... Um, you know, it's it's basically modeling humans in pre-industrial societies. The, the, the simplest way is to think about human populations like animal populations, 
And so, you know, like if if the number of, um, are, 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 you know, if you're if if if, if if you have a population of foxes and they're eating rabbits, the number of rabbits goes up. Initially, the foxes, you know, get a lot of rabbits per, per fox and they, they can lead around. But basically what it does is it, it, by leaving a resource constraint, it just leads to more foxes. So eventually they go back to equilibrium and they're no better off than they were. Each individual fox is no better off than they were before, but just more foxes. And so um, the simplest version of that using model plays back to the societies and that that makes that generates predictions which fit a lot of the patterns in the demographic economic data we see in the past with, with some exceptions and so in that world it was hard to get the capital income growth going basically and so one way economists think about the story of modern economic growth is to is to think about the, the escape from this Malthusian trap Ida galore is kind of famous for working on, on this uh question and so then um, what kind of what kind of things from this game? Well, the Black Death, uh, by raising per capita income, is associated with the development in Europe, at least, of uh, of slightly different demographic practices, which may have been in place before the Black Death, but they might have been accelerated by the Black Death. So this is one of these things called European marriage pattern, whereby people in Northwest Europe start marrying later. And what this does in the mouth using the environment is it basically reduces the rate of population growth. And so you're still about using, in a sense, there's still a feedback mechanism pushing you back towards the equilibrium of and subsistence. But now it's pushing you back more slowly because um, on average, a woman is having maybe three surviving children as opposed to five. Because a woman is marrying at 22 or 23 rather than at 15. And fertility in early, early, uh, when, when, when women are that young is, is very, very, very uh, determinative of, of of, of surviving children. And so um, that's a world where the Malthusian pressures are less immediate. So this is the world of England, like 1500, 1600. And so the idea is like you're, you're above subsistence income for longer. And maybe that gives people more extra resources to be innovative or to specialize in kind of non agrarian trades um, and, and other so sets in place some kind of positive feedback loops, which, which are then. Uh, playing a role in in the, in the background conditions for the industrial revolution and modern modern growth. Okay, understood. Um, and I mean, are there instances of um, other countries that suffered kind of population declines and they didn't see a similar kind of dynamic as the European side in that in that case? So we, we, yeah, we don't. Yeah, so we don't see this in the Middle East. Is is one thing we don't see this. In, in East Europe, although East Europe isn't affected as much by the Black Death, let's say uh, the um, uh, Middle East is. is. So this, this EMP probably has earlier roots in the Middle Ages. So it was probably in place in part before, and it's just strengthened by the demographic shock. Um, scholars think there are other ways fertility has been limited in other parts of the world. So China and Japan also limit fertility in some ways um, with different institutions. So why is EMP the decisive one? It's kind of a, it's still a scholarly debate. Um, one strand of literature, so some people are skeptical that it is important. So Sheila Ogilvy and co-authors argue that it's not a decisive factor. And their evidence is that Germany is very much, in some sense, Germ Germany has all these traits that England has. Their high rates of uh, high age of first marriage, restricted fertility, um, but it doesn't seem to be going towards industrialization in the 17th century. It's it's got some kind of proto industry, but it's it, you know if you look at Germany in isolation from the rest of Europe, you can imagine Germany just being in kind of a pre modern equilibrium uh, for a long time. It doesn't look like it's about to industrialize. So maybe so, so there's some skepticism, but it's as crucial as all that. Again, there's a distinction we draw between. Possibly being a necessary condition and but not being a sufficient condition. Um, one strand which makes this European marriage pattern potentially more transformative than the alternatives in, say, China and Japan. Because, uh, so, so for example, in China and Japan, uh, the men often work far away from the woman. They, they go off to another village to work in the early years of marriage, and that reduces fertility. There's also practice of female infanticide, which reduces fertility. Um, 
but, but the EMP is associated with market development because the norm... Just remind me what EMP stands for, by the way. The European marriage pattern, sorry. Yeah. Which is the high age of first marriage in Europe. Yeah. Um, so this, this fertility restricting practice, uh, that's associated with women working. So there's a paper called Girl Power. Uh, so it's not... So, so female, women, f- female age of first marriage going up is, is, is a kind of... It's an empowering thing from a kind of feminist perspective. It's like, you know, people, people you claim it's like associated with greater female independence. Uh, why? Well, because women are not going straight from their father's authority to their husband's authority. They're actually sometimes leaving their parental home, working as, as milkmaids or, or working in the field or as domestic servants for several years, earning income, working on the market, and then having some savings to. To, to 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 set up the household with their husband when we marry at say twenty three, and so um, it's seen as complementary to kind of market development as well. It's it's complementary to the emergence of a of a of a labor force based on kind of wage labor and 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 and, and um, fe- relative female autonomy, relative obviously not compared to today, but relative to the to the status of women in free. Medieval Europe. So in the Roman Empire, girls married at 13 or 14. And they, they were pregnant after that. In the Middle East, they're going from uh, similarly their husband, their, their father's authority to their husband's authority. And they're not really having opportunities to work outside the home. Western Europe, in comparison, is, is, is seeing more uh, female labor market opportunities. Uh, again, this is not to say this is a decisive factor necessarily, but some people think of this as, as one of the, one of the, um, distinguishing characteristics. Okay. Now, uh, we haven't talked about uh, colonization and slavery so far. You know, there's an argument that Western Europe and the US benefited a lot from having slavery. Um, so what's your take on that? I mean, what, 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 does, what, what does the data or the historical record show on, on that count? Yeah. So, I mean, I think here it's, 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 it's important to take, uh, it's, it's like, Dismiss the simplistic explanations and then take, like, you know, like, you know, we can hold in our head, like, uh, a nuanced interpretation. And so, like, um, so the, 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 the obvious proof is that the, you know, US in particular is a slave economy until, until like mid 19th century, until, until emancipation in 1863. And all of the leading Western European economies in the 18th century, um, you know, like France, England, Dutch Republic, uh, um, like earlier portions of Spain are all implicated in the transatlantic slave trade, you know, deeply implicated. And the, the structure of their economies, their colonial trading economies, if not their domestic economies, it involves a lot of coerced labor and slavery. And this is uh, evil. Um, we, we think it's evil now. People at the time, when we understood, like, we often didn't know the full evils of it. But once those evils started to come out in the 18th century, and people read a, read accounts of the horrific um, nature of the transatlantic slave trade and the deaths involved. This was sh- this was shocking at the time. So it's not like it's not like you know people are different morality necessarily. Um, uh, so so that's undoubtedly the case. But but I think what's misguided and and so the nature of the um, transatlantic economy, which is part and parcel. Of the preconditions to British industrialization is a in slavery. So you know, like that's why you, you you can have all these um you know wealthy families in the United Kingdom and their ancestors uh, involved in the slave trade, basically. Um, and some of the, you know, there's not always direct connections between the industri- industrial revolutionary innovators are not directly connected, but they might have been getting some investments indirectly from from the slave trade. Uh, but I think what's what I, I don't find useful is telling history as a morality play myself, particularly for understanding how the economy grows. And so, um, uh, so I separate, we separate out, Jared and I separate out the question of like, you know, is economic growth in some sense caused by colonization of slavery from a question of like, was slavery part and parcel of how the, the, the growth process unfolded? And so we, 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 we don't, Really, we're not really interested in a, in a morality story where, like, capitalism or growth is contaminated by some original sin. Therefore, 
we have to repudiate it or say it's bad, which is some some of uh, you know that's like what you pick up from some of uh, journalistic literature, especially in the United Kingdom. America or well, Americans are worried about American slavery, but the, the British have become particularly worried about the implications, I guess, sort of of the origins of the Industrial Revolution and slavery. Um, and then go to your comic history and literature. So um, what we do basically is we we rule out the simplistic story. So the simplistic stories. Oh, oh, kind of, you know, uh, shouldn't we take it too seriously? They're obviously wrong because um, the converse, the wealth and resources stolen from or taken or coerced from from the colonized world are not sufficient to generate the size of the increase we observe. So it can't be a simple transfer story. Whatever story you tell about slavery or colonization, it has to be um, embedded in a story about a very dynamic economy in England. Uh, because otherwise, other con other empires would also become industrialized. So the Spanish are obviously extorting extracting huge amounts of income well from from silver mines in, in, in Peru, they then industrialized. The Romans were getting individual Romans were becoming unbelievably rich through the enslavement of huge amounts of people in, in the ancient world that they then become rich. So it's so there has to be some interaction story about about the particularly dynamic economy that England had in the eighteenth century and then what role colonization and slavery plays into that. Um, in general, I should just add, like, yeah, so you really have to focus on the 18th century kind of economy to tell the story. Most of Britain's empire, what we think of as the British Empire, was colonized after Britain industrialized. So it's more of a product of industrialization than a cause. Um, so that's a bit of a long, that's a bit of a roundabout. Yeah, question, okay. So I, I guess I, what, what I'm hearing is that there's lots of other instances or uh, in fact, like not not just the rest of the world, but European nations engaged in slavery, colonization that didn't industrialize, didn't get rich, mm. whether it's ancient Rome, whether it's, whether it's Spanish. Then, of course, if you globalize it, there were other slave owning nations, you know, involved in the slave trade that they didn't, you know, have the big sort of economic gain. But how about the other way around, um, where the nations that are the subject of colonization get sort of somehow stunted, you know, and they yeah. they, they they have an impact. So, for take India for example, you know, when when Britain, um, uh, you know, occupied India, India at the time, you know, was was on, on some metrics incredibly wealthy. By the time the, the Brits left, it was less wealthy on a relative yeah. basis globally. Well, yeah, so it great. seemed like the country was asset stripped, <laughs> and you know, I mean, yeah, to, so to use kind of crude terms, yeah. but and same in some Western African countries as well. Yeah, well, we, we 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 I touched briefly on slavery in West in in, in Africa, so I think. Um, um, like the slave trade does seem to have left the legacy in West Africa, um, but but Africa, the African case is um, is is a variegated one. But let's say this like like slavery. There's ever strong evidence slavery in, in Africa has a negative legacy, which is kind of visible on the data today. So I don't, I don't I think that's um, we need to dispute that. Let's take India because India is a more interesting case in some sense because India is a much more sophisticated, much denser populated economy. It's got a market economy. It's a, you know, sub Saharan Africa, um, country, you know, this is country towards some revision, they say it really doesn't have very stable, deeply institutionalized states uh, prior to European colonization. There are a few kind of states, but they, they really are quite transitory um, and, 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 and not long lasting. And there's not much. Um, Sustained evidence of kind of, you know, there's some metallurgy, there's some trade, but it's not, they're not one of the more prosperous parts of the world. India is, okay, but, but a lot of the stats or the evidence people bring to bound this is a bit misleading. So, for example, like, um, you know, like, particularly from a kind of a, a nationalistic perspective, uh, kind of, like, you know, with a recent kind of uh, Hindu Vista movement is like world nationalist historians in India, and to their story, it's like, you know, the Brits destroyed the Indian, the Indian economy, <laughs> the assets stripped it. And so, a lot of the statistics they they, 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 they show are misleading. So, one would be like share of GDP. So, if you look at share of world GDP in 1600, well, firstly, this is very rough data where we're estimating share of GDP in, in, in 1600. Britain is tiny, India is huge, China is huge. And so, they'll talk about that and I'll show how that changes. Uh, after by, by 1900, Britain's huge, India and China are small, and this will be a story of, kind of asset stripping. But actually, it's not not at all. That's a story of industrialization, and and India and China look rich in 1600 because their populations are relatively very large. 
um, not because per capita income is high. So um, both India and China are very much in this Malthusian world. And so they've been, they have productive agriculture and they've been long, long settled. So we've had agriculture for a very long time. They've had cities for a very long time. They've had all the accoutrements of kind of traditional agrarian societies. Uh, but what, what that leads to in a Malthusian world isn't very high. It's not riches in the sense of food understand. It's not high per capita income. It's just dense populations. So India, India's free industrial wealth is, is there. It's real. If you're an observer going to India in 1000 or 1300, it's more densely populated than, say, England has larger cities, but the average Indian is not really any richer than the average English person, particularly. They might have access to a few more goods, their markets a bit more sophisticated, to be, have more spices, maybe better clothes, but most people are still quite poor. And so the high point of the Indian economy that we have data for is about 1600. This is kind of a high point of the Mughal Empire. And but at that point already, it, in, India is poorer than England on per capita terms. Not richer, but they're kind of they're not far apart. England is not much richer. India is pro relatively prosperous. Um, it, it's a market leader in textiles, basically. But but it's uh, but these textiles are are, are are based on hand hand production. So they're weavers and spinners, uh, hand production, and the density of a population has kind of pushed wages down. So the people are not not you know you could you could make a living as a, as a, as a as a as a spinning spinning income textiles or, or weaving, but you're not necessarily particularly prosperous. And so India has a, that's the high point of, of the economy. So it's like it's it's like you know I don't think it's if you want to benchmark it, it's not it's like what we think about say, the Roman economy, um, which is also prosperous, big cities, market economy, but. But the people seem to be poor. It's comparable maybe to the Middle East at its high point as well in the 8th ninth century. Um, but we don't think it was on track to industrialize. And then what happens in the 17th century, and it will be the 18th century, is that there's the two things. Firstly, there's a deterioration of the climate, and then the Mughal Empire fragments. And the Mughal Empire fragmenting leads to devastating warfare. And basically, this is why the Brits get... Uh, a tow in basically, right? So the British, um, British um, East India Company are just traders and they find themselves building an empire basically because it's because of the Mughal Empire is collapsing and they need to have a military force to kind of protect their markets and to build more markets. And they're just one of many predators of carving up bits of, in, uh, of India. And so that's when living standards in India start to plummet. And then, then what happens thereafter is by being integrated through the Sydney company into the British Empire, the Indian producers are just exposed to the full force of competition from British industrial products once Britain starts to industrialize. And so, whereas in 1700, the British are, are using mercantilist tariffs basically to protect their industry from the Indian producers because Indian producers can now compete them. By 1800, it's a reverse situation. And from an Indian from production perspective, in the textile industry, what screws them over is like you know they're forced into this free trade arrangement basically, and so they can't they don't have any protection in terms of tariffs, and their, their producers suffer from this. But it's more that than um, being asset stripped basically, and so I think for being you know, there's a nationalist Hindu narrative which is kind of wrong basically. The British Empire is not great for India, I would say. It's not good, mm. uh, particularly. Um, there's an LSE economist, Keith Roy, who, who writes about this a lot. And the British are good on some measures. Basically, it's a mixed bag. They, they do build the railways. The railways do integrate the economy. They do try their best with infrastructure. They, make, they try to drain uh, swamps, and, and they try to vaccinate the population against various diseases. But... Um, but they don't, they, they, they don't really um, do much to industrialize. And their biggest failing is really not building a better public uh, public education sector. Uh, so what I talk about, you might have some views about this. So I, I, I should let you um, interject. But um, I talked about this with, with um, some people who are kind of um, scholars, scholars of India. And they, they think, absent the British, the rich parts of India would have done better than they did under the British. Like the most developed parts of India would have done better. 
that the least developed parts of India would, would have done worse, potentially. And, and India may not have been a unified, it may have been, it may have stayed fragmented. So you might not have India as we now know it. You might have like a multiplicity of, of, of states, some of which might be like Singapore, or they might be really prosperous city states, but other, others would likely be pretty poor, like, you know, poor over in India today. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of hear you on that. And actually, that goes to another point about education. And in your, your book, you did talk about, you know, the Protestant Catholic dynamic in Europe, because obviously there's a Protestant work ethic idea um, that, you know, it's, it's because of some kind of religious theological difference that allowed kind of Northwestern Europe to sort of develop first uh, rather than the Catholics. I mean, what's your, what's your take on, on that? Um, so the evidence hasn't been super kind to specific work ethic. I mean, there's, some, there's something to it in the sense that like, um, a, lot of, a lot of saint, saint stays are eliminated by the Protestants in Northern Europe. So there's some evidence, I, I, I mean, I mean cross-country evidence, but, um, but whether or not there's a deep psychological change uh, along the lines they were suggesting, you know, um, which leads to capitalism, I think most people are not uh, a skeptical of. The best evidence, which we review in the book, is that basically Protestantism is associated with early literacy. Um, and actually, yeah, so I mentioned, so if you look at, say, India and the British, uh, most vast majority of people are less literate. The British provide some elite education. So they, they want some, uh, they, they do try, I mean, in some sense, the, the Indian nationalists are a product of the British elite education and Nehru and Gandhi and so on. So they, they, don't, they don't do it. They don't ignore education, but they don't really rise up. They don't bring up the masses of a population to, to basic level of literacy. So on independence, India says lags behind to Japan and literacy, and that's a, that makes a big difference for economic growth in the fifties and sixties. And so going back to Protestant Catholic division, the the one thing we can measure and we know is that Protestantism is really associated with literacy, because um, that's you know in some sense of the um, Protestant. Uh, theology is you, you kind of you, you you develop a relationship with God by reading the Bible. And if you can't read, you're basically you know, in some sense you're probably going to hell. I think. Mm. I mean, like you're likely going to. And from a Calvinist perspective, you're likely going to hell because how can you develop a relationship with God if you if you're not engaged with Scripture? So, so basically, Sweden um, is is is, is, is like incredibly literate. Uh, Germany, so Germany and Sweden are more literate than England actually, but England has still got higher literacy by pre-modern standards. And uh, literacy doesn't seem to matter that much in the, in the initial industrial revolution, but with the second industrial revolution, which is kind of what, what we discussed is like, you know, after 1850, rise of kind of um, a broader set of, of mechanical and manufacturing jobs, not just from textiles, but other types of jobs. Being literate just means you're a much more effective worker. Um, and so, so Protestant Catholic divisions may not be that big a deal in the 16th century, 17th century, but by 1900, there's this stark pattern. The Max Weber saw, basically, Protestant countries are richer than Catholic countries. But that gap narrows later. But that gap narrows later once the education of uh, in exactly. Catholic countries like, catches yeah. up. So, exactly. So, so now in Germany, Bavaria is the richest part of Germany. Yeah. But when Weber was writing, it wasn't. It was, you know, the North, the North was richer than the South. Yeah. So if we tie all of this together, I mean, why did, like, specifically Northwestern Europe get rich first? Yeah. So as, as I kind of, I, I guess you've been giving me over, this overview, um, um, we're kind of, in this book, we're doing kind of an unusual thing in that we're both telling a story about a specific thing, which is like the Industrial Revolution, why is it Northwest Europe? But we're tying it into like a general story about what things are good for growth and bad for growth. And so... Taken from that perspective, um, you know, Jared likes to say, like, there's no silver bullet. There's no, like, it's not a predetermined thing. Um, but there's a, com com um, a, a combination of factors which we see coming together in Northwest Europe, particularly in England, after 1600, really. And these things are making this uh, growth takeoff more and more likely. So uh, you could, you could, no one of these things is sufficient, but if you take out any one of these things, then maybe maybe the, the industrial revolution is, is is delayed by a substantial amount of time, 
And maybe it doesn't even take place in, in, in England or, or Europe. And maybe it doesn't even take place for hundreds of years. Okay. And, so and, like those, and those factors are geog geography. Yeah, the geography, so, so, uh, so, so it's geographical. So yeah. So um, Britain's on the Atlantic coastline, as is the Dutch Republic. It's very integrated into its trading economy. So their geography is good for trade. So you have a favorable geography. They, they have um, markets. Markets which are supported by a broader system of rule of law and property rights. So you know it's possible to get rich based on trade and commerce and industrialization in Britain. Like you know, you you have an incentive to invent the spinning jenny or uh, the water frame or you know all these other in, in, in innovations. Um, so these are broad conditions. So you have a large market. Um, pre the pre-industrial economy is kind of prosperous. Um, you know, like. Incomes above subsistence due to things like the European marriage pattern, uh, restraining fertility, due to these other factors we've discussed. Um, there's maybe cultural preconditions like, as well. Like we didn't talk about this one, but like the Jumakowski argues that like a bourgeois culture is it's a precondition. So you know you don't lose all your social status by becoming a uh, industrialist or an entrepreneur. You can retain you. you, you might not be the highest status thing, but you. You have an, you don't you don't have an incentive to leave Converse as soon as you've made some money. Those are important pre preconditions. But then you have things like like you know coal. There's there's a relatively abundant coal in the north of England. That's another geographical factor uh, that gives rise to an incentive to shape a kind of a higher energy using economy. Um, Europe is politically fragmented. That seems to be one. I think one of the factors. Uh, an empire might have been less conducive to this. So all of these things are kind of um, playing into industrialization becoming more and more likely. So it's a stochastic process, but it's more and more likely to bubble up in England, Northwest Europe around this time. And once it gets going, though, then this is a key point. Um, this is the key key thing, I think, that the first breakthrough into kind of uh, a non-organic, Economy and an energy intensive economy. This first breakthrough is, I think, quite difficult and requires quite a lot of specific factors to be in place. But once it's occurred, then it's, a, it's like a benchmark. Other countries, other societies can look at that and kind of copy parts of that. And they don't need all the preconditions to be in place. So this is like, um, this is an idea developed by a guy called Alexander Gershenkron. Uh, um, he was an economic historian in the 60s, 70s, and he said leapfrogging is possible. So if you're, say, Germany or later to Japan, uh, you can look at kind of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and it's not like you need every precondition to be in place. You can look at the key ones, and, 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 and some kind of leapfrogging is possible. So the technologies that um, Britain develops took a long time to kind of get right. Like, so the steam engine takes a hundred years of kind of R and D to make it profitable in in like you know in a, in a factory settings. The early steam engines are only profitable when used to drain uh, mines uh, in the north of England, but or, like they become profitable to be used more widely. And once they're profitable to be used more widely, they could be used in other parts of the world eventually. They're not like unique to a British setting. So yeah, so we distinguish between these like specific conditions for the original development of, of economic growth, and then broader conditions, like what enables you to enjoy catch-up or uh, leapfrogging growth. Yeah, and understood. And I mean, one, I mean, one, I guess one anomaly, not anomaly, but one question I have for you is China, you know, because in the last like 10, 20 years, China's had probably the fastest growth any nation ever on earth has ever seen, bringing so many people out of poverty. And, you know, it's, it has a different type of political system, you know, it doesn't seem to sort of look like Europe in, in many different ways. So, I mean, how, how do you explain China? Yeah, so I think there are two two things to explain China. One, one I've said, which is a Gershon Kron story, which I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm going to revisit. But the, 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 the other one is comes from the neoclassical growth model, so the solo growth model that, you know, everyone studying is in uh, undergraduate econ. And so the solo growth model basically says that if you're far away from a frontier, so you have a capital stock, which is well below like the steady state capital stock, then you can experience very fast growth just by basically conver through convergence, just by 
uh, both importing technologies. You've got to import technology from a frontier, and you've got to have relatively high rates of investment, and then you can converge. But once you get closer to the frontier, as as your capital K kind of converges, the equilibrium steady state capital K star, as you grow for slow, it'll get harder, and it'll get more dependent on technological uh, development. And so the settler growth model basically says you should have convergence. And the puzzle is, is actually, uh, after, say, World War II, only really some countries, like, say, Japan, converged from the US. Others diverged, including China. Um, and so back then, you have to bring in institutions, because the Stolo model has no institutions. And so the benchmark for looking at China is that um, the Maoist experiment was um, a total failure in terms of industrializing China. It was only success. It was successful uh, in some dimensions, public health, education, literacy, um, which actually would, will, will become important later because the Chinese population was quite illiterate in 1949. And they're very illiterate by like, 1979. So they, they put some preconditions down for growth, but their per capita income is, 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 is so low in 1979 and their agricultural productivity is so bad that, in some sense, only a small number of relatively modest reforms introducing a, a market system in agriculture, rewarding people for producing stuff, was sufficient to basically generate very, very fast growth. Um, and then uh, the Chinese government, I mean, you could give them credit, I think. I think the credit they deserve, whether, whether intentional or not, relative to other economies is they sequenced their reforms in, in a way that worked out well for them. So at first, it's just agriculture. In agriculture, um, they were very low-hanging fruit. Their policies were so bad before. You know, like they, 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 they just collectivized agriculture. They disincentivized any investment in agriculture. They, they wanted people to have, uh, you know, um, um, furnaces in every household. So every person's very steel producer. Anyway, they, they pursued such bad policies. The, the policies they then introduced, the liberalized introduced prices and markets were, were, were quite modest by global standards, but had a huge bang for their buck. So agriculture is liberalized first, and then they sequence it. Sequence it. So only later they liberalize things like manufacturing and other areas of the economy. And whether by luck or design, that, that you know, they, they, they removed the distortions of their economy in such a way that really uh, allowed them to pick up a lot of low-hanging fruit, grow very fast. Then they kind of, they, 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 the timing was fortuitous in the sense that um, Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea were already moving up the value chain. So you know, Japan had been a, a textile producer in the earlier part of, mid part of the 20th century. But by the 1980s, 90s, it's moved up the value chain. And so uh, China was able to, to kind of, you know, grab that basically, um, specialize in like things like textiles, low end manufacturing, and and boom that way. They benefit from their geography. They're close to a region of the world growing very rapidly from the 80s onwards. Um, so they're trading with, you know, obviously Hong Kong is critical. Um, we can trade with other East Asian economies developing. They benefit from the fact that India is only reforming really in the 1990s. So they, they have a head start in India. Uh, the world economy is booming. World trade is booming. Um, so, so they really um, uh, have very good timing. And then they're able to move up the value chain. And they can skip several steps. So, you know, the Chinese have been very innovative more recently in things like electric vehicles, things like uh, software. Um, so so um, that's been very much a success story. But... The institutional economist in me is skeptical that this will continue, basically. Um, for, because um, at a certain point, to be an innovative economy close to the frontier, I think that's incompatible with the level of top-down direction they seem to have. And particularly with this autocratic retrenchment that we see since around 2010 under Xi Jinping, that seems incompatible, I think, with growth of the frontier. And and if we move on, I mean, to kind of put your, uh, <laughs> you know, forecasting hat on. I know you're you're more of an economic historian than than a futurist, so to speak. But given all that you know, I mean, what's your what's your prognosis, say, for the U.S. for the next five ten years? 
you know, or or for Western Europe. Yeah. So so well, Western Europe I think is different to the US. Um, the Adam Smith is a case. So there's a lot of ruin in the nation in the nation, and so um, this is um, this is a bit uh, uh, um, which is which is which is to say like he he was complaining about bad policies in Britain at his time, but he was also saying you know like despite these bad policies, don't be too much of a do do monger. And so that's my kind of view of the US. So I think um, I see a lot of like policies I I think uh, are stupid often in the US or like wrongheaded policies. But the economy is so robust and so innovative, and it's so big basically that local state policies don't matter that much because a capital can move, firms can move, they can relocate. And um, so even though I think sometimes government policy in terms of uh, tariffs. In terms of industrial policy, in terms of antitrust, in terms of like um, uh, subsidies, uh, which are designed to encourage particular sectors of the economy, I often think these are not great policies. They're, they, they're good politics, they're bad policies. The Biden administration is very fond of things which look or sound good, but there's very little forethought, as far as I can tell, in terms of consulting with like economists, in terms of policy design. It's it's really a striking change, actually, from a Clinton administration through to the Obama administration. Uh, whatever the rhetoric of U.S. policy, economists were kind of at the forefront of design. So things like you know a, a carbon tax, like, you know, but but the policies economists design are not good politics. So from from the Trump administration through to a Biden administration, huge amounts of continuity, despite the the right. The left swing in terms of uh, looking at things which are good politics or bad policy, but despite that, basically, I'm very optimistic about the US. Um, okay. Western Europe, not so mo- not so much. Um, I mean, I think the tech regulation in Western Europe looks very onerous, and I think that's you know, that clearly has downstream effects on, on tech innovation. And similarly, the UK as well. Uh, the UK has itself in a policy bind, and it doesn't seem like they can get out of it. I keep being hopeful they can, but they they never they never seem able to do so. Uh, but and, and how about, how about fine... India? You know, people always talk about India as the next China, but obviously India is kind of hampered by you know sort of poor institutions and all, all of those sorts of things. And uh, but do, do yeah, you think so they kind of turn the corner? I, I don't know enough actually about the Indian economy. I, I, I like to be hopeful there. Um, I think it, it's big. And having a big market gives you quite a lot of flexibility. It's just it's getting those institutions right, and I don't know on a local level um, what what's this, like how much there kind of what's a barometer between like you know, local rent seeking versus policies which are going to encourage more innovation. But India obviously has a huge potential because it's got high human capital and it's, it's English speaking. Uh, largely, so that gives a huge, um, you know, like software basically. But but right now, the, the the impression you get is a lot of software engineers still go to the US. So India has to be, you know, doing well enough that's retaining that talent. But I'm I'm more optimistic about India than I am about China. Yeah. Okay. Now I just wanted to round off with a couple of sort of more personal questions. One is uh, we do have some young people listening to the podcast. You know, people who who will leave college this year. What advice would you give them as they enter the real world? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think, um, well, I think entering the real world is actually a good idea, uh, rather than, but I mean, sometimes doing a master's is fine, but like, rather than uh, saying in academia uh, all the time, which is which is what I did, uh, they're getting real world experience. I think now as well, there's so many tools to study. So like before, people would study at college and they would enter the real world and it would stop basically because you, you just, now like podcasts, um, books, uh, online docs, uh, sub stacks, you know, like there's, 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 there's no reason to stop growing once you reach, reach the, um, edge and leave college. I think, so I think that's crucial. And I think, um, yeah, I, th- I think, uh, not doing a job where you'll be replaced by AI in the next five years would be a much less practical advice. I mean, I, I don't know how many of us will be replaced by AI, but a lot of jobs, uh, you want to be a job where you're complementary to the AI, not, not substitutable with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I love reading books, including yours, uh, of course. Uh, what were some of the books that really influenced you over the years? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a great, yeah. So there are books which is good to read when you're young and books which, uh, you know, like, so, so there's some, 
So I, I mean, I, I uh, let me think of some of the ones. So, so Guns, Germs, and Steel we cite prominently in our book of the classic. Uh, lots of it's wrong. Um, it's one of those books where you know it's twenty years old, and individual things can be wrong, but it, it gets you thinking about these questions. So I think you know, like young people should read those types of books, non non fiction books, which open your eyes to a new world. So. You know, I like reading books about the Roman Empire, like Tom Holland books about the Roman Empire, because they give you a perspective to a different world. Um, I've recently been reading some books about the Aztecs. It does the same thing, because you're, you're thrust into a new environment. So I read quite a lot of history, actually. Um, I don't read business books myself. I tend to read history. Then in terms of econ books, um, economics is, a, is, a, is, a, is an article-driven field. So as you get more specialized, you're reading articles, not books. When I was young, I read a lot of books by Doug North. Um, um, but they're very dry and like, you know, they're so out of date now. So stuff's wrong in them. But but when you're young, they, they kind of prompt a lot of different ideas. So I, I suggest books which give you ideas, basically. You don't read one final point of advice, actually, which which is don't Assume you're cleverer than the author, even if you are, basically. Like, read books to learn what's new or original or full thinking in the book rather than um, what's wrong in the book. One is my, um, I think we all, often, many people have this. Many people who think they're smart, like myself included. I have a thing where I, I, I pick up a book and the first thing the book says, which is a mistake, what I think is wrong, I'm like, this person's an idiot and I throw the book away, basically. <laughs> Um, and I stopped reading it. And, and, but then that stops you learning from those books. So um, when you're young, especially, it's good to cultivate the attitude of what can I learn from the book? Not like, am I, not like, am I smarter than this person on, any, on one dimension? And if I am, I don't need to read it anymore. Try and, um, yeah. And I said okay. the other thing, which is a tip from Tyler Cowen, which is um, rather than reading books, read literatures. So like basically, if you're interested in a topic, Try and get hold of like several books on it and like swap between them, interface between the things. You know, uh, read a book alongside something online or watch a YouTube video on a topic. So you're not, you're reading a book in a more interactive way. That's my other. Oh, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah, I should, I should actually, I've never really done that before. No, that's fantastic. And, and finally, what, what's the best way for people to follow your work? Uh, well, I have a new Substack actually, so uh, I'm just on, I'm on Substack, and the, the Substack actually is the title of a book. How the world became rich. I intended to set up a Substack when we wrote the book, but then I was too busy, so I didn't. But now I've got a little bit more time on my hands, uh, so I'm on Twitter. Um, Mark Koyama is my Twitter handle. Uh, I have a Substack. Uh, I have a website where you can look at my academic books, but the Substack will have more of a non-academic, big picture, popular audience kind of stuff. That's fantastic. So yeah, with that, I mean, I'm sure we could have spoken for much longer, but yeah, th thanks again for taking the time to, to, to speak to me. You know, I've certainly learned a lot and I'm sure our audience have uh, great, as well. Yeah, thanks, Bill. It's, uh, it's been great. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.